15 in our last lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 17, The Spinal Cord and the Spinal Nerves. The spinal cord, as we know, is part of the central nervous system. It is found running through the verbal canal and is protected by the vertebral column from injury. Um, as you can see here, we have the vertebra themselves, spinous process, body of the vertebra. Here is the spinal cord, and around it you can see pretty clearly the dura mater and arachnoid mater, which have fused together. Uh, the spinal cord is surrounded by three uh, protective sheets of connective tissue that completely surround it up to the intervertebral foramina. Uh, the first of these, the most superficial, is the dura mater, as seen here. The dura mater is the thickest. Uh, of the meninges, made up of dense irregular connective tissue, and also the most superficial. Um, in the verbal canal, there's also an epidural space, which is everything between the dura mater and the vertebra themselves. Uh, the next deepest uh, meninges is the arachnoid matter. The arachnoid matter is often fused with the dura mater. The arachnoid matter is a thinner layer of connective tissue. Sometimes there will be a subdural space if some sort of interstitial fluid or blood builds up between the dura mater and arachnoid matter. Uh, the third meninges is the pia mater. The pia mater is very thin and transparent. It lies on the spinal cord directly and many blood vessels run along the pia mater. Also there is always a space between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. This space is called the subarachnoid space and it is filled with the shock absorbing cerebral spinal fluid that helps to protect the spinal cord and bow it in location. So looking at the spinal cord, we see that it is a roughly oval shaped structure. It extends from the inferior end of the medulla oblongata basically as the tissue passes out of the foramen magnum and goes all the way down to about the uh, first and second lumbar vertebrae. Um, there are two enlargements or widened areas on the uh, spinal cord. These, there's the cervical enlargement where many of the nerves that innervate the upper arms originate from and there are, is the lumbar enlargement where many nerves that innervate the lower limbs uh, originate from. The very end of the spinal cord is a tapered conical structure. It is called the conus medullaris. After that, there are still important nervous tissue in the verbal canal. However, now it is lower spinal nerves that are continuing through the verbal canal. And these nerves are referred to as the cauda equina because someone thought they looked kind of like a horse's tail. Finally, at the very, very end of the verbal canal, the meninges all fuse together and anchor the spinal cord to the coccyx. And this final bit of structure is referred to as the phylum terminale. Here is a transverse section of a spinal cord. As you can see, the gray matter is found on internally, often looking kind of like an H or a butterfly, while the white matter is on the outside, is superficial. Um, there are two main structures at either sides of the spinal cord. There is the posterior median sulcus. It's the small separation between the right and left sides of the spinal cord. And then there's the anterior median fissure, much more obvious separation between the right and left sides. And as we all know, the gray matter is because of a high amount of neural cell bodies are found in that location. Uh, uh, there is also a central canal. The central canal is a small uh, tunnel running the length of the spinal cord and is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The little crossbar of uh, gray matter is referred to as the gray commissure and helps to connect the right and left sides of the spinal cord. And then anterior to that is the white commissure, a crossbar of white tissue that helps to connect the right and left sides of the spinal cord. The gray matter also gets broken down into three horns. There is the anterior gray horn that can name, contains many of the somatic motor nuclei. There's the lateral gray horn that contains many of the autonomic motor nuclei, and the posterior gray horn that can contains cell bodies and axons of interneurons, and these are synapsing with the sensory neurons. The white matter is also broken down into three regions. There is the anterior white column, consisting of ascending and descending tracts leading to or from the central nervous system. 
the lateral white column and the posterior white column. Again, these are tracks or bundles of axons carrying information to or from the brain. The ascending tracks are propagating sensory impulses from receptors to the brain, while the ascending tracks are carrying motor impulses from the brain to effectors. Again, the gray matter, the H, is receiving and integrating incoming and outgoing information and is composed of many synapsing cell bodies. Sensory ascending sensory tracts and descending motor tracts are localized to different regions within the spinal cord, which of course can be very relevant if someone suffers a spinal cord injury because what is affected can help determine where in the spinal cord that injury is. Different kinds of spinal cords. You can have um, many kinds of trauma to the spinal cord that can partially or completely damage and uh, divide it. And this can lead to paralysis. Monoplegia is the paralysis of spinal cord injury leading to paralysis of only one limb. Paraplegia is injury that leads to paralysis of both lower limbs. Hemiplegia is paralysis of upper limb, trunk, and lower limb of one side of the body, while quadriplegia is paralysis of all four limbs. A complete transection is when the spinal cord is cut completely through, while a hemisection is when the spinal cord is only partially cut. Nerves. Nerves are um, structures composed of bundles of nerve fibers. The way this is arranged is basically you start off with the individual nerve fiber, which is a axon that may or may not be myelinated. Around that axon is a sheet of connective tissue called the endoneurium. Then you bundle up a, a group of uh, axons of nerve fibers into a structure called a fascicle. And this fascicle is then surrounded by a sheet of connective tissue called the epineurium. Then you can bundle up the various fascicles with, as well as with blood vessels. And this is the nerve, and the nerve is uh, wrapped around by another sheet of connective tissue called the epineurium. So nerve fiber, an axon, and associated myelination, if it's myelinated. The endoneurium is connective tissue around the nerve fiber. Perineurium, connective tissue around the fascicles. The epineurium, connective tissue around the entire nerve. And this structure should look familiar to what we saw in the muscular system. Um, coming off of the posterior side of the spinal cord are what are called posterior rootlets. These are axons of sensory neurons carrying information to the central nervous system. And coming off the anterior side of the spinal cord is the posterior rootlets. And these are axons of motor neurons sending commands out to the body. And again, you have right and left of both of these. Uh, the posterior rootlets will then um, combine together to form the posterior root. Uh, and then the posterior root will also include a structure called the posterior root ganglion. This is a swelling caused by the accumulation of many sensory cell bodies in this location. The anterior rootlets will also uh, converge, come together to form the anterior root. And as these structures are leaving the verbal canal, they will come together to form what is called the spinal nerve trunk. The spinal nerve trunk is the convergence of the posterior and anterior roots. That means all spinal nerves are mixed nerves. They have both sensory and motor uh, information. However, as soon as they have left the intervertebral uh, foramina, they then quickly split into various branches or rami. Uh, there is the posterior ramus. Posterior ramus serves to innervate muscles and skin of the posterior surface of the trunk. There is the uh, a meningeal branch that re-enters the vertebral canal and serves to innervate structures in that area. There is the rami communicantes, which is a structure that is going to um, be part of the autonomic nervous system specifically. And finally, there is the anterior ramus, which is usually what we refer to when we talk about a spinal nerve that serves to innervate the limbs and the muscles and skin of the lateral anterior surface of the trunk of the body. Plexuses. Plexuses are networks of axons formed when different uh, nerves are sending axons to and from each other. So this is a, a mesh of interconnected anterior rami that are sending um, nerve fibers between them. Um, eventually, off of these plexuses will come the various nerves that are going to different areas of the body. For the sensory uh, spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and they are always mixed nerves. So, cervical plexus is found in the cervical region. It is formed by cervical nerves primarily. 
and one named nerve that comes off of it is the phrenic nerve. Uh, the brachial plexus is also sort of in the cervical area. It is mostly cervical nerves, although there is a C1 uh, thoracic nerve that also incorporates into it. This leads to the name nerves of the upper arm, including the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve going to the surface structures of the arm, the ulnar nerve running along the medial side of the arm, the median nerve down the middle, and the radial nerve along the lateral side. The Thoracic spinal nerves tend not to form plexuses. Instead, they just go out to that region of the body. They are known as either intercostal nerves or thoracic nerves, and they do not have plexuses. So here we can see the intercostal nerves. And then there is the lumbar plexus found uh, in the lower part of the body. It is made up of lumbar nerves. Two main nerves that come off of the lumbar plexus are the femoral nerve and the obturator nerve that are innervating structures to the lower limbs. There's also a sacral plexus coming off of being formed by sacral nerves. Uh, these plexuses end up forming the sciatic nerve, the largest nerve of the body that is innervating the lower limbs, especially posterior side of them. Sciatic nerve will split toward the um, lower part of the leg into the common fibular nerve that goes laterally and the tibial nerve. So lumbar plexus, sacral plexus, uh, femoral nerve, optor nerve, sciatic nerve splitting into the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. Dermatomes. Dermatomes are regions of skin that are providing sensory input for the central nervous system via one specific spinal nerve. So you can basically say this patch of skin is sending information to this specific spinal nerve. This is useful information to know because it can help a doctor diagnose if there's nerve damage or spinal cord injury. So basically they'll take something, a brush or something, and they'll touch different parts of your body, asking if you can feel it, and if there's an area that is numb, then they go, oh, huh, C5, for instance, must be damaged. Spinal reflexes. Spinal reflexes do not incorporate uh, the brain. They are something that can occur automatically when the proper stimulus is generated without input from the brain. Uh, basically, the way it works is you have the sensory neuron. If the sensory neuron becomes um, excited by, say, perhaps the doctor is hitting your patellar ligament, um, this will cause a stretch stimulus that will cause the sensory neuron to send a signal to the central nervous system. Um, this will also send information to the brain and perhaps to other structures in the body, but for the spinal reflex, that sensory neuron will synapse with a motor neuron that will automatically lead to the appropriate effector, the appropriate skeletal muscle, and this will cause you to kick your lower leg. This is the simplest reflex arc possible, a sensory neuron, a motor neuron, and the effector. Obviously, other parts of the body do know what's going on, but they are not necessary to cause this uh, event to occur.